Welcome back to the channel. <clears throat> this video was originally planned to be part three of the compressed air dryer series. I was going to take some temperature measurements on how efficient the radiator was and how much adiabatic cooling was occurring in the post tank condenser. I purchased a laser thermometer and attempted to get some temperature readings. At first I thought the thermometer was broken because the readings were all over the place and not even remotely accurate. Obviously I was doing something wrong. So let's try and understand how these thermometers work and how to properly use them. First we must understand some definitions. Infrared thermometers measure the infrared radiation emitted by a surface. An infrared thermometer is often called a laser thermometer because the built-in laser assists the user in aiming the gun at the area being measured. The laser is not required. Some of the lasers also produce a circular dashed halo around the laser center. This is used to visually depict the area that is being measured. I'm going to talk about the distance to spot ratio. Most internet articles describe this as the area that the thermometer will be measuring the temperature of. This ratio is actually describing the field of view for the IR sensor. The higher the ratio, the narrow or the F or field of view. So a 21, 20 to one ratio will yield a field of view of one inch at 20 inches from the IR sensor. In order to get the best temp possible, you want to place your target surface just inside the IR sensor field of view. You must calculate the distance required to get the required IR field of view onto the target surface area. Let's get real. Nobody's going to do that. This is why some thermometer lasers generate a halo around the center laser dot. Ideally, this laser should have the same field of view as the IR sensor. This would make focusing the thermometer easy. Just place the target surface area inside the laser circle or halo and you're already done. Here is what an IR thermometer looks like from a functional standpoint. The effect is that you are getting a generalized temperature of the entire IR sensor field of view. You want to try and place your target area just inside the IR sensor field of view. This will yield the most accurate temperature. The thermometer will only report the aggregate temperature of all surfaces in the IR sensor field of view. So let's talk about the aiming offset. My thermometer's laser is offset 0.75 inches from the center of the infrared lens. This would mean that the laser aim point is displayed upward by 0.75 inches and that you need to adjust your aim point accordingly. If your thermometer has a halo to depict the laser field of view, the aiming process is a two-step process. You first would adjust your distance to make your target fall within the halo and then offset the aim point by 0.75 inches. Some thermometers have two lasers. The IR laser field of view center would be equidistant between the two laser dots. However, this configuration only works if there is enough surface area for the two laser points to display on, which often does not occur. Measuring a thin pipe is an example. However, having a sizing halo is far more useful than having two lasers. My AIMS thermometer has a 20 to 1 or 2.8 degree IR sensor field of view. At least that's what it says on the package. I measured the laser halo diameter at 20 inches and the halo diameter was 1.75 inches. This means that the halo, laser halo is projecting a field of view of 11 to 1 or 5 degrees. Ideally the two field of views should be equal but often they are not, which is happened with my unit. For my thermometer, the target surface should be about half the diameter of the laser halo. This is what your ranging view should look like with a halo. The area in the blue circle is the area that the thermometer will actually read. Once you have the range, just 
raise the aim point until you get the highest temperature reading. This is what the laser and IR sensor field of views look like. You can see the two field of views do not start to intersect until around 11 and a half inches. This depiction assumes that the two field of view axes are parallel. So let's go out to the garage and verify my analysis and see just how erroneous your readings can be if you do not understand the impact of field of view and laser offset. Okay, we're, back. we're in the garage right now. We're gonna be heating this uh, rebar to get pretty hot because we want to make uh, some temperature readings on it. And this is 3 8 inch rebar which matches the uh, compressed air lines that I'm using. So this would be a good example. And 65 degrees out. Okay, that should be good enough. Okay, I'm going to turn the unit on. So I got the red dot on it. Now, I want to move that out to about right there. But you can see it, it's only measuring the background. So now if I bring it up, wow, went up to 246 degrees. So you can see that offset. So now we're going to come in at an angle and see if we can get it on the very first time. There it is, 242 degrees. So you can see the impact of the offset of this laser in the center of this. And so you gotta be careful when you do that. So after a bit of a detour, these are the compressed air dryer results. The room temperature was 65 degrees Fahrenheit. The compressor head temperature uh, was 165 Fahrenheit. The radiator output temperature was 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Height, and that's what I predicted and expected. The adiabatic cooling, however, was only three degrees Fahrenheit, which was much lower than expected. The only way to accurately measure the relative humidity of your compressed air is with a special instrument that costs a minimum of 600 bucks for a very, very cheap unit. I did not feel like making that kind of expenditure, but there is another way we can get a feel for how efficient the dryer design is. Run the line air through a small desiccant unit. The smaller, the better. Monitor how long it takes to change to pink. If it takes several weeks after heavy use, you know you have sized your two condensation tubes adequately. Adjust their lengths as necessary to get the desired results you want. It will take some time before the condensation tubes start excreting water into the traps. Don't be alarmed by this. This is expected because the condensation tubes retain significant amounts of water before they will start to cascade water into the water traps. Due to the elevated uh, pressure dew point temperatures, the compressed air remains saturated and will not absorb any of this residual water. Thanks for watching.